Let's talk about 10 more mechanics in Final Fantasy XIV that are either not explained at all or not explained super well. Let me explain them to you. If you haven't seen it, I have explained another set of 10 mechanics the game doesn't explain very well, which you can find in the iCard or the description. And remember, if you have a tip of your own or know about a peculiar mechanic yourself, be sure to tell me about it in the comments. Now, onto the list. Number 1. The Global Cooldown. Now, the convention of calling it the Global Cooldown, usually abbreviated to GCD, is actually something that dates back to other MMOs. Simply put, the Global Cooldown refers to the recast time on weapon skills and spells, which typically is around 2.5 seconds without equipment, but often is less and occasionally more. Unless stated otherwise, the recast time on any weapon skill or spell affects all of your weapon skills and spells globally as a cooldown period. As such, the quote-unquote recast of actions are typically simply referred to as cooldown, and if a weapon skill or spell has a proper cooldown, then they tend to additionally state that this cooldown is not shared with any other actions. The reason why you will commonly find that weapon skills and spells don't have the strict 2.50 second cooldown is because this is reduced by the skill speed and spell speed stats for weapon skills and spells, respectively. If a weapon skill or spell has an unusual global cooldown, but is still reduced by these speed stats, then it will have a rather long-winded explanation to clarify this in a roundabout way, such as seen on Ruby Rite or Six-Sided Star. If the weapon skill or spell has a not global cooldown that is affected by speed, then they will also clarify that this cooldown is not shared, as seen with Gnashing Fang and Summon Bahamut. Sometimes, this detail can be missing as seen with Ether Charge. The abbreviation GCD is both commonly used to refer to the cooldown period of around 2.5 seconds itself, but also refers to weapon skills and spells themselves as a combined term depending on context. Finally, using an instant weapon skill or spell causes an animation lock, which prevents you from using anything else for half a second plus two times your latency. If, on the other hand, a weapon skill or spell has a cast time at all, then this animation lock is actually contained within the cast time itself, which will come up again a bit later. Number 2. The Off Global Cooldown These are usually abbreviated to OGCDs and refer to abilities. The reason for this is that abilities are not affected by the GCD and hence are off the global cooldown. This means that you can use these actions between weapon skills and spells. This is commonly called weaving. However, using an ability, just like using a weapon skill or spell, causes an animation lock for half a second plus two times your latency, preventing you from using other actions. Certain abilities incur an unusually short or unusually long animation lock, with Thunderclap being known for being slightly shorter and most Dragoon jumps being slightly longer, with Stardiver having by far the longest animation lock in the game, outside of limit breaks. Certain abilities incur some amount of global cooldown of their own, and often these abilities also are on the global cooldown themselves. They tend to state it if that is the case, as with Monk's Meditation or Ninja's Mudras. Due to this dynamic of all actions incurring animation locks, you can only fit so many abilities between two weapon skills or spells. To be explicitly clear, actions with a cast time of 2 seconds and a GCD of 2.5 seconds leave no room for weaving. Actions with a 1.5 second cast time leave room for exactly one ability. Actions with a 1 second cast time or less leave room for two abilities due to the cast time itself containing its animation lock, and instant actions also leave room for two. Outside of extremely specific situations, weaving more than two abilities per GCD is not recommended. For describing different types of weaving, we tend to use the following definitions. Single weaving, using one ability between two GZDs. Double weaving, using two abilities between two GZDs. Triple weaving, using three abilities between two GZDs. And as stated, unless a specific trick requires it, it is seen as a mistake. Early weaving, single weaving, and using the ability as quickly as possible after the GZD itself. This is the most common way to weave abilities. Late weaving. Single weaving and using the ability as late as possible without clipping the following GZD. 
Often, if you are single weaving a damage buff that affects your GZD attacks, late weaving it can lead to you being able to fit more GZDs within the buff window than if you early weaved it. Sometimes, a double weave can combine an early weave and a late weave if the exact timing of the second weave matters in this manner. Clipping. If the animation lock of an ability delays your next weapon skill or spell, this is commonly called clipping and tends to come up either if you try to weave more abilities than there is actually space for or if you late weave too late. Number 3. Slide casting. Seeing it in action often looks like the game is lagging or bugging out, but it is a very consistent feature. The animation lock of actions with a cast time is as previously mentioned included in the final part of the cast itself. This means that if a spell has a cast time of 2.5 seconds, then the final half a second plus 2 times your latency of the cast actually contains this animation lock, which doesn't really make that much sense, but don't worry about that. During this animation lock, the game has already decided that you have finished your cast, and so you can start moving. This is known as slide casting, partly because when observing other players performing it, it looks like they slide into their new position. It is worth mentioning that with more latency, the exact time frame where you can slide cast becomes less consistent. However, you can always slide cast the final half a second of the cast. A tip for practicing slide casting is to place an emote on your bars, as these will always light up as ready when the slide casting window is active. Number 4. Placed AoEs and hidden bonus damage or healing. All placed areas of effect, or AoE for short, strike once initially when you place them, and then tick every 3 seconds. The first initial tick is just as strong as all the other ticks, but is not explicitly mentioned. What this means is that Dark Knight Salted Earth actually does 300 potency, Summoner's Slipstream does 610, Ninja's Dotton does 560, White Mage's Asylum heals for a total of 900 potency, and Scholar's Sacred Soil heals for 600 potency, in contrast to Sage's Kera Holly, which only heals for 500 due to not being placed. Technically, Machinist's Flamethrower and Blue Mage's Apocalypsis and Phantom Flurry also benefit from this mechanic and all essentially include an extra hidden tick on top of the once per second they clearly mention. Number 5. When exactly attacks resolve? For most procs, as they are commonly called, an action is considered resolved or executed the instant the action begins or with cast times when the slide casting window begins. This is the reason why a monk using Opo Opo form Bootshine is immediately awarded a chakra stack for a critical hit, even though the critical hit appears a good second later. This is also why low level black mages can get away with casting Fire 1, be awarded Fire Starter and then be able to cast Fire 3 instantly with little issue or interruption. There are three common exceptions to this particular rule however, and it tends to be related to involving other players in the activation. Reaper's Arcane Circle, Monk's Brotherhood and Dancer's Esprit all share the property that they are activated when a party member successfully lands a weapon skill or spell. For Dancer and Reaper this is rarely an issue, however specifically for Monk the order that things resolve in during Brotherhood can matter, as the Brotherhood Chakra from the Monk's weapon skills themselves are granted around one second later than the actual attack execution. Meaning that if it is a critical hit, you can feasibly gain the 5th chakra, spend it and then get the Brotherhood chakra. On rare occasions, the fact that the Brotherhood chakra triggers happen when the attacks land can also sometimes lead to attacks initiated as Brotherhood is ending, not actually granting any chakra due to the buff having ended by the time the attack actually lands. Number 6. Enmity Generation and Healing Ticks This is a rather new one. As of patch 6.2 of Endwalker, all healing over time ticks generate zero enmity. A notable distinction here is that enmity is still generated by applying the healing effect in the first place, as gaining buffs or applying debuffs also generate a small amount of enmity. What this means is that if a white mage places their regen on the tank before the tank enters combat, then regen generates zero enmity. If, on the other hand, the white mage places regen on the tank when the tank is in combat, then the initial application of regen itself will cause a minuscule amount of enmity, 
more than zero, but none of the healing over time will generate any, meaning that as long as the tank hit every mob with something, this is negligible. This feature that healing over time takes generate zero enmity applies to everything, by the way. So Paladin's Holy Sheltron generates no healing enmity, and Summoner's Everlasting Flight generates no healing enmity. They both do, however, generate a negligible amount of enmity from being applied. Number 7. Non-stacking barriers and how the game decides which one wins. In most cases, this is relatively obvious. If you attempt to apply a shield that someone already has, then the target will keep whichever one of the shields is bigger. This always applies if the buff name is precisely the same. If you attempt to apply a shield with a different name that doesn't stack with the existing shield, then the new shield will always win. This notably applies between scholars Galvanize from Adlocurium and Sucker and Sage's Eucratian Prognosis. However, in this specific situation, Eucratian Diagnosis always wins, regardless of the order and size of the shields. The only thing that overrides Eucratian Diagnosis is a bigger Eucratian Diagnosis. This does kind of make sense, since Eucratian Diagnosis is necessary for the Sage to produce other stings. However, the personal shield from Eucratian Prognosis that also has the capacity to produce other stings does not have this same protection. Number 8. Extremely specific power boosts. The most common of these is increases healing magic potency by X%, percent, which is distinctly different from increases HP recovery via healing actions by X%. Percent. Healing magic means that the boost only affects healing spells, which means, for example, that Scholar's Dissipation and Fey Illumination will boost Adlocurium's effectiveness and even embraces effectiveness in the case of Fey Illumination, but neither of the buffs will boost Lustrate, Excogitation or Whispering Dawn. This also applies for White Mage's Temperance and Astrologian's Neutral Sect. All other healing increasing effects instead use the more broadly applicable recovery via healing actions description, which counts for anything that is considered a healing action, which seems to include everything that has either an upfront healing effect or applies a healing over time effect of some sort that requires no further action to activate. Four distinct exceptions that are not affected by these types of healing boosts are Warrior's Blood Wedding, Nascent Flesh and Raw Intuition as well as Dark Knight's Walking Dead buff from Living Dead, which has the same functionality. Outside of content-specific bonuses, the only other example of this mechanic in regularly accessible actions is Red Mage's Embolden, which specifically boosts only magic damage for the Red Mage themselves, but boosts all damage for everyone else. This also means that if two Red Mages use Embolden simultaneously, they will be able to benefit from both of the effects. This is significant for Red Mages because all of their damaging OGCDs deal physical damage. Technically, all of their mana spending melee attacks also deal only physical damage if not empowered by mana, although this should never actually be relevant. Number 9. The Unique Damage Type, which may be similar to what is often called True Damage in other games. As of patch 6.3 of Endwalker, all attacks are accompanied by an icon that signifies what damage type an attack is. A blue sword for physical damage, a purple wand or stave for magic damage, and a green POW icon for unique damage. The two first types are rather self-explanatory, but unique damage interacts very differently with mechanics in the game. Notably, very rarely can unique damage be reduced at all, and often they will always do their full damage, ignoring even defense on armor. On top of that, unique damage often strikes straight through invulnerabilities as well, so if you've ever looked at Paladin's Hallowed Ground and thought, huh, most attacks you say? Unique damage attacks are that exception. In most situations, the only way to bypass unique damage is by flat out having more HP than the attack deals. Number 10 how pets interact with buffs. To start, pets scale differently to players, and typically assuming their damage output is somewhere in the ballpark of 80% to 90% of a player's damage is not entirely off track. It varies a lot because each pet is different in minute ways. Now, pets absolutely benefit from raid buffs and damage buffs, however, as they tend to often be entirely untargetable or not even really exist, it can be confusing to understand how they interact with buffs. 
Simply put, while they are often viewed as glorified damage over time or healing over time effects, they scale with buffs in real time, as opposed to buff snapshotting which we went over in the previous 10 mechanics video. This means that the machinist is very interested in making sure Automaton Queen is summoned in the time frame where the most raid buffs are active. The same for Dark Knight's Living Shadow. If not for the fact that Bunshin's cooldown often misplaces it from raid buffs, the ninja would have been interested in planning this in the same way too. And finally, and absurdly so, Astrologian's Earthly Star is also considered a pet. Now, that is all for this video. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to support me and my channel, you can make sure to let the YouTube algorithm know by liking the video, leaving a comment, subscribing and hitting the bell to get notified when next I post a video. And if you want to give even more support than that, you can also become a member of the channel like these wonderful people here. Fun fact, since Shadowbringers, the fact that heal over time effects generated enmity at all mainly was an issue if the tank wasn't actively making sure to hit every enemy before moving on. This is because before Shadowbringers, tanks generated far less enmity, which meant that if the healer was just going to town with tons of healing while the tank was still pulling, it was a very real problem that the healer might get aggro. This is why some players still flat out refuse to use any heal over time effects while the tank is pulling, not knowing that it is no longer a threat or an issue at all.